concepts of uh, Florian Petra. Yes. Um, it's a little bit different from 2013 because um, that time to now we continue the developing the research with the scholarship and with the researchers. And um, now I, I hope that you understand my poor English. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't always remember of this uh, because um, this work is, uh, is a idea of how the uh, uh, metropolitan region could be designed with the world. Right? But um, the idea is the um, need with the uh, concept of infrastructure of mentality and imagination. Maybe this would yeah. be a good start for our conversation last meeting in Libra, and uh, uh, I try wrote this uh, test you know, from an improvised and health camp to an open and <coughs> work of art, collective authorship, open to the future, liberty and innovation that promote the real together confidence and healthcare between the different people and cultures. I decided to start with this statement uh, yes. because maybe, I don't know, could uh, be a bridge with the morning conversation about the blind camp. I don't know. Fuck that. And here, uh, I quickly plant of the waterway ring project. When you can see the Tietê, Tietê River, Pinheiros River, University of São Paulo is right here. The Taman Batei River that you began in this week on top of the fence this morning. Here, the outer Water very ring, but uh, outer hydro ring, hydronel, and inner hydronel. For our point of view, uh, São Paulo as a fluvial metropolis is a set of urban infrastructure, public facilities, and social housing. Not only these three axes, but this is the basis of the so Paulo has a full of And uh, these questions, urban leaders and students, how clean and open that can uh, be the as unit of integrated planning and management. It's very important to understand the, this collective art of building the fluvial space. Understand the, this space as a social space, a learning space, a space where we can duplicate ourselves. Then, all the leaders and streams of other TFT River Basin at São Paulo Metropolitan Region, and for our point of view, the research group. Understand that the urban region or urban streams is constituted by uh, a central canal for clean water of drainage and side tunnels for sewage and diffuse pollution of dirty drain water from the streets of the river basins under the canals. Larger, eh? um, more than one, the urban regions have to understand. But at least three uh, axes, yeah? one can open air canal and two pipelines. Yeah? But with uh, diffusion pollution, it's necessarily four, uh, five axes, yeah? because more two pipelines are, uh, catch the 
waste water with the food of our children. And more than this, uh, these human leaders and students want to have uh, treatment in the micro stations for sewage from river basin of tributaries located at the mouth of tributaries which treat 100% of wastewater and excrements before launch to the central canal aiming reuse of urban water waters. This concept is very important, the reuse the urban waters. Um, the consum consumption of uh, Sao Paulo is uh, 63 cubic uh, meters per, per second here. And, uh, uh, but the, the, in this point, in this point, uh, in this point, uh, the flow of the, the, the gas is 100 cubic meters per second. Then maybe we can reuse. We could uh, catch the water to the water in the, at the downstream here and put the and put the sewage treatment treatment on the percent and up, upstream. This consumption how much? Sixty-two liter per second. So they keep here will be two to two for two and the inhalers will be full. Yeah. Well, because they're downstream and the inhalers. And downstream is a uh, downstream is this uh, 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 some power metropolitan oh. region stay in this upper tier the river basin. Mm -hmm. uh, here is a tributary of light. Then, if you, we measure the, the flows in yeah. this point, so that's what 100 cubic meter mm -hmm. per second. Almost twice, twice the consumption. Yeah, almost. Yeah. almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Another treatment micro stations for diffuse pollution of the dirty rain, rain water from the streets of the river basin of tributaries, located at the mouth of tributaries, which treat again 100% uh, of the rain water before launch of the central canal, aiming to reduce even the, uh, the rain water pollution. Okay? Two treatment micro stations, one for sewage and another one for, for uh, dirt to rain, rain water. And it's all, uh, we need more than this because it's important to uh, Sao Paulo Metropolitan Region uh, has a uh, Good uh, flood control. Then we concept and design these uh, retention lakes with flood gates located at the mouth, confluence, and the springs of tributaries for drainage and water flow control during flash floods, which maintain water level during the dry season. It's not a piece enough. It's not a detention, detention lake. The retention is dry, no? uh, but this is a retention you know? uh, that maintains the level of water even the dry season. Then, uh, contribute of uh, the urban landscape, you know? the view of the mirror of the water. Beyond the 
transportation lakes, we propose the irrigation canals and artificial deltas with flood gates located at the downfront influence of tributaries for drainage and water flow control during flash floods, which maintain water level during the dry season. Garbage is another important issue because Possible to think about the quality of the urban waters without thinking about the issue of um, management of garbage and rubble. Then we propose garbage and rubble recycling plant from the river basin of tributaries located at the mouth of tributaries. We will recycle 100% of garbage and rubble to avoid that they, they are launched in the canal and transform them into a raw material. Remember, in, the, in 2013, we show for you the idea of the, the three parts. That is a kind of disassembled line. Right? Is the assembled line proposed by Ford, in Ford, but on the opposite side, right? disassembled line. Then, now we, we propose a capillar uh, infrastructure of an uh, industrial plant for recycling this garbage uh, to transform in the raw material. And uh, we confirm the concept of eatable fluvial urban forest on the banks of urban rivers and streams, aiming to recover the green belt and promote the urban agriculture permaculture and flood security using urban waters. Then, as Israel, as Israel uh, uh, used today, the idea is to reuse the urban waters for urban agriculture. And urban fluvial parks on spring, stone plains and mouth of the urban rivers and streams structured by artificial lakes and deltas for flood control, which can be used as urban fluvial beaches. This morning we talk about the fluvial beaches and the philosophical, metaphorical, um, but maybe this could be uh, another way to understand the concept of urban fluvial parks, and network, um, understand as the urban fluvial beaches. Fluvial boulevards with uh, wide tree lined sidewalks, traffic lights which 200 meters and maximum speed of 30 km per hour uh, is very important. Instead, urban highways along the side rivers and streams, aiming fluvial promenade for walking and biking slowly. A walkable city and biking city is a concept of, of slow urbanism. Mm -hmm. Fernando Haddad, the former mayor of Sao Paulo, proposed 40 kilometers per hour. Uh, urban bridges with uh, traffic lights and maximum speed of 30 kilometers hour. Instead, highways bridges crossing rivers and streams aim for the promenade for walking, biking slowly. Drawn bridges to allow canal boats and flash boats to pass under them. The drum bridge, the drum bridge, no? lift no? or slide bridge, is very important if you consider the the macro drainage no? from, uh, from flash floods and also to canal boat. No? Uh, and of course, urban uh, infrastructure, public facilities, and social housing. This is the second axis, public facility sets for education, cultural sports, leisure, social care, and health. Located at the head of the bridge, I don't know that in English is the name is head of the bridge. The head? The head. The head of the bridge. Oh, yeah. yes. Modulated the, the head of the bridge. The bridge, the, the head. The bridge modulating the capillary, capillary network of urban fluvial parks at springs, confluence, and mouth of the bridge. 
always the spring is one place in the mouth with the our nudge. No. Public facilities in front of food or parks, shipyards. This is our that uh, we are developing now eh, with the researchers as Caio and Natasha here. Uh, shipyard school, municipal school for all in city, municipal city pool, environmental education center, solidarity, <coughs> economic culture center, municipal social care center. Another concept that we developed is the concept of Canal City that is located alongside of the waterway. The Canal City has fluvial districts, districts structured by mixed use blocks, including social housing. It's very important that at least 40% of the buildings <coughs> must to be social housing, the mixer use and mixer social class. No? Along the road, the Fluvial Boulevards, with tramway, very important the, the public transport between public facility sets and ground bridges. This croquis is Angelo asked to put it. Yes. Yes. Um, because now I talk about the multiply the ground floor no? as Chicago. No? When, when you can see the two levels, no? the lower level of the city, the ground floor, the upper level. No? And that creates this uh, technical basement. No? And this is the terminal, the pipeline for sewage. Mm. Just to have another one. No? Okay. Boats, uh, tramway, underground tunnel. Then, the seats on floodplain. Fluvial seats, fluvial districts built on floodplain of Tamanga de Itiete Pinheiros and Arica do Arica do Valores, structured by mixed use blocks, include social houses along the road at fluvial boulevards with tramway between public facility sets and road bridges. This is the reconstruction of fluvial districts with a new upper ground floor above flood level, covering the old ground floor to transform it into new technical basements and tunnels for metro lines, sewage and rain water drainage. We developed a design at the fluvial districts of Tamandate River, Kai and Natasha, last year, 2016, designed base of this design. The streets of the reservoir is another important issue because we have maybe two or two and a half millions of inhabitants that live in between the reservoir. Then we named this as a district of reservoir buildings in Guarapirana that is districts of the springs. Very important because this is opposite of the uh, last slide. Through your seats on, on flood plain. Uh, this is the flood, flood uh, reservoir seat. Is a uh, district on the springs with parks and ports of peninsulas, arms and bays. And we develop here uh, now um, and the last year. The Kuruk to Indian Reserve, Rufalu Park, and Moloré Island at Fundão do Grajaú, that Mario Gandolson and Snows. Mm -hmm. We developed a study in this area uh, at Billings Reservoir. And also in the Clube Nautico Guarapiranga at, uh, at Fundão of Jardim. Fundão is the end, the end of the world. Fundão of Jardim. This is the EcoPorts project. EcoPorts are a kind of public facility set with um, um, shipyard school and school after rolling sailing. Uh, 
And the last one that we are developing now is the floating city or floating studios. Yeah? It's a kind of pioneer floating public facilities for environmental educational centers on the reservoir buildings in Guarapiranga, rural temporary building at ports of peninsulas, islands, and bays where not have aquaports yet. Sorry, my name is Then, urban waterways yeah, or canal boat network uh, in the urban waterways of Upper Tepe River Bass and São Paulo Metropolitan Region is a metropolitan system of urban waterways for the urban fluvial transportation of cargo and passengers in the navigable canals of rivers, Tepe and Pinheiros, and in the reservoir buildings in Guarapiranga. This is what we have today. We have three canals and two reservoirs that's possible to navigate. Even to the dirty waters in the canal, and the reservoir is the water supply for people drink water. No? It's possible to uh, uh, implement the navigation, through your navigation. But urban waterways looking is more than this. The urban waterways looking is a metropolitan system of urban waterways for the urban field of transportation of cargo and passenger in the navigable canals and the, of the rivers, the Tepinhas and Tamandatei, including now Tamandatei, and the reservoir buildings, Barapiranga, and including Taya Superba Reservoir. And this is uh, include in, in the waterway link, and the uh, Taya Superba, this is the uh, Taya Superba Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Then we design uh, this uh, artificial canal, this one and this one. This is with 17 kilometers long, and this is with 4 kilometers long. The urban waterway wing uh, is a uh, wings, wings in the plural are formed by the buildings that have an outer uh, hydranel, hydro, hydro wing, which connects the TFT waterway with the buildings reservoir and by the buildings that have the inner uh, hydro wing or hydranel in Portuguese. The building style superb outer hydranel is built by a 17 km artificial canal with two stairs of locks or stairs of sluice, sluice, I don't know in English. Sluice or locks? Sluice. 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 Sluice, which connects the two reservoirs uh, with a rich canal, a summit canal in the top, you know, uh, aiming to propose for water supply, flood control, control and navigation. It's a kind of Panama canal. The building Stamandote in Iranel is built by a four kilometer of artificial canal with two stairs of water sluice, which connects the building's reservoir and Tamandote canal in the same canal moved to propose for water supply, flood control, and navigation. And the both uh, directions, huh? and the concept of uh, uh, communication channels, huh? passes communicants, things, passes communicants. Yeah. communicants. Yeah. I jump, concept. More, some sketches. This is the uh, this design. This was drawn uh, with the maps of 19th century. This is Tamanda Te River. This is a concept of artificial delta. Yeah. This is another concept of artificial delta in this Ipiranga River, Tamanda Te River. This is the lake central, uh, 
place on historic hill. This is another crown, again designed with the 19th century maps, where we can see that in that time people we had another mentality or imagination, we could maintain this lake with 600 meters wide, three lakes designed by three dams, three dams that could transform it, the historic hill into a kind of peninsula with Anagabaú uh, stream and Tamando Atei, Tamando Atei River. No? One, two, three, four, five lakes connect us. You can see uh, uh, through some, uh, Google Earth the plant of Hamburg City, Germany. This is another sketch. The main harbor, no? or general harbor. No? General harbor is this one. The Sao Paulo was founded uh, at the edge of uh, the Tamandate River with the general harbor or main harbor. Then the first industrial valley of Brazil, Tamandoi, Tamandate Canal, has to be rebuilt to make fluvial navigation possible. Three lakes will be built at the confluence of Anagabaú stream. The historical view and the general port or general harbor no? will be reflected in the water mirror of the lakes, as in the painting by Benedito Calisto of the vase of the Carmo Flores. Uh, is a painting, the name is uh, Inundação na Base do Carmo. And I finish my presentation with this picture, no? this painting that Guy Vizdik show, show us this morning. And for me, it's, the, it's very important. Uh, just a piece. Just a piece. Yeah. Now we uh, see this, this, this is the lakes. This okay. is, these are the lakes. These are the lakes. No? Because this is the dams. Oh, the dams. Mm -hmm. Only if the people at that time put a kind of device, the floodgate, below the bridge, in the middle part here, here has a middle bridge, only a floodgate could maintain the water in this place. Oh, so sorry again, my English. The difference that not being in, in situ makes having the distance and uh, also uh, fundamentally being able to write, <coughs> which is uh, what uh, I seriously I consider what uh, I did for three years with the undergraduate studio inspired in the um, in this idea of the Econel, which I can see has evolved quite a bit since uh, 2013, because now we've seen the process. For instance, the Delta, which uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. We can discuss it later. <coughs> so anyway, because uh, I don't have the uh, the pragmatic uh, issues and local organizations on my shoulders. I could uh, sit down, for instance, and before I start thinking about what I'm going to present here, uh, read again uh, a book that the producer wrote after he came <coughs> to Latin America in 1929, Decision, Decisions we translated it to English. Although Le Corbusier came with the object to get a job. Um, as Christine knows very well, 
because she wrote a fantastic book on, on, on his work. So, um, so I reread that book, but also another book that's not well known at all, because as far as I know, it's never been translated to English. And that's the book of his six conferences in Rio in 1936, which was supposed to be published here in, uh, in Brazil in Portuguese in 1950, but was never published. And almost pa partially published a lot later. And then a French friend of mine, Greek friend of mine, uh, published in Paris in 2006. So um, it was interesting in terms of the differences between his first trip and the second trip that was very pointed because um, uh, it happened uh, at the point where uh, Getulio Vargas was here. So the situation had radically changed. And Corbu Le Corbusier didn't mind that at all because they early, earlier than that, a year before, he tried to get an appointment with Mussolini to send uh, to, and he visited Rome to sell his plans to Mussolini. Okay, so then he came here to see Getulio Vargas, but he couldn't see it, so he failed. But he still um, came to Rio and gave his six conferences, as opposed to the 10 conferences in, in Buenos Aires. So, um, so uh, oops, no, that's not it. How does this work? Person? Hmm? Or useless? Oh, okay. Let me see. Because that's the rationale that I want, and this is not working. I need to go back to the beginning. Oh, I can. Okay. One click, where in the left? So um, water <coughs> was always present in the Corbusier's Buenos Aires lectures. Uh, when he described metaphorically streets as rivers where cars flow. Or, and this is his plan for Buenos Aires, and then you can see that square platform and then that round little island there. And um, when he also described metonymically in, in the uh, fluvial downtown of his 1929 project for Buenos Aires as an island, which is this famous drawing, or as the background for uh, in the project for Rio, where viaducts transverse the city framing the beaches, the ocean, or when he draws himself, I would guess, uh, contemplating the water from the linear ribbon viaduct he had just invented in his plan for Rio. So I'm suggesting that water was always in his mind, but rhetoric. And um, but the, the way we deal with urban water now has radically changed. It's definitely changed in the last 80 years that separates us from Le Corbusier's first trip to Latin America. The Sao Paulo Idranel project, Alexandre's project, represents, in my view, the radical changes in approaching the megalopolis where the presence of water is not rhetorical any longer. It deals, the, Idranel deals with the materiality of water. Within a new concept of urbanism, where water is seen as part of the complex entanglement of urban related issues. Pollution and landfill, transportation and leisure, food and education. <coughs> this new approach requires a new transdisciplinary urbanism and a new toolkit, which was, that is a new kit of tools. Uh, which was the focus of the research that 
my research that took the form of the urban studios that I conducted in 2013, 14, and 15. So the question for me was, uh, that was the first time I taught seniors. And um, I decided that in a urban studio, which is what the studio was supposed to be, we couldn't just play with the traditional uh, tools of architectural teaching, of architectural pedagogy. So, um, so in a way, um, one of the first questions was uh, the particular way in which this new approach would affect the notion of brand and the notion, traditional notion of section. And in that sense, I really enjoyed, I made a note, note on these new concepts that appeared in your journal, the upper ground and the lower ground, this kind of unfolding of the ground. Now, um, obviously, because we are not uh, determined by pragmatics, uh, we uh, discussed and we implemented a number of new relationships between solid and liquid ground, and not just of the solid ground itself, which Corbu never, in a way, thought about. Where objects and buildings can float, move, be submerged under water, and new concepts could emerge. So, the the device, what I call the device, became the tool for the exploration of this new notion of ground. And it turned into another concept, the urban architectural device, when applied to the specific sites that we explored in the different studios. Uh, San Miguel Tablista, the Billings Reservoir, and then the CHS. <coughs> so I'm going to show those three very different studios concerning three different sites. But I'm first going to show, in general, this idea of the device, which for me has a very specific role, which is to detach. I mean, the students at that point, the senior students, have had a number of architectural studios, so they are already inside architecture. And for me, it was really important to get them out of architecture to bring them back. So um, in order to do that, um, I uh, went to a, uh, the notion of device that derived from a text by Michel Foucault from 1977, where Foucault uses the term in French dispositif or apparatus when it's translated to English, uh, which I converted into device, which is another way of designating apparatus. In an interview where he discusses, um, it's called the confession of the flesh, which I also enjoy the idea that the device would come in a dialogue about sexuality, and uh, because that involved obviously subjectivity and the body, which became also a very, very important element for the students, architects from, from design and students when we teach them architecture, we don't discuss the body. Okay? Uh, and in a way, I wanted to go back to the body not as uh, a Vitruvius and Verdi body or like the modern art they call the same, but a more contemporary notion. So, um, so when um, so Foucault answers the question, what is the meaning or methodological function for you of this term apparatus or device? And Foucault says, um, okay, this, so this is for me the contemporary way of looking at water in contrast with Corbus idea of water. And now, uh, what is the device? So Foucault says, what I'm trying to pick out with this term is firstly a thoroughly heterogeneous ensemble consisting of discourses, institutions, architectural forms, architecture comes as the third, regulatory decisions, laws, administrative measures, scientific statements, philosophical, moral, and philanthropic propositions, 
In short, he says, they said as much as they unsaid. Such are the elements of the apparatus. The apparatus itself is the system of relations that can be established between these elements. So that immediately launched me and my studio beyond architecture. That is, you could say I was dealing with all the possible departments in Princeton, except that, of course, uh, the question was to take uh, students in their last year who had two years that we could call in a college kind of interdisciplinary, and then were sort of narrowed down, narrowed down their focus into architecture to open it up again. But then I also thought, well, I need to bring the 1977 idea of device to a more contemporary notion because you know history for our students starts perhaps like five years ago. So uh, 1977 is like prehistory. So I thought, well, the equivalent of the 19th century would be like around 2010 these days. So I went to George Agamben in a text where he expands Foucault's definition. And he says, further expanding the already large class of Foucauldian apparatuses, I shall call an apparatus literally anything that has in some way the capacity to capture, orient, determine, intercept, model, control, or secure the gestures, behaviors, opinions, or discourses of living beings. So now suddenly the body itself becomes part of the definition of the device. And he says, not only therefore prisons, madhouses, and he's definitely referring to Foucault, the panopticon, schools, confession, factories, disciplines, judicial measures, and so forth, whose connection with power is in a certain sense evident. But also the pen, writing, literature, philosophy, agriculture, cigarettes, navigation, computers, cell phones, and why not language itself? Which is perhaps the most ancient of apparatuses, one in which thousands and thousands of years ago a primate uh, inadvertently let himself be captured, probably without realizing the consequences that he was about to set to face. So, uh, so I liked also a lot of this definition because it brought back language, it brought back discourse, it brought back narrative. And you'll see that in the projects I'm showing, those, that, that part, the discursive, becomes really important. And again, you know, since the students are at that point uh, thinking about their thesis, and the thesis is going to be just writing, it's, I thought, well, it's not bad that they also write besides uh, designing or drawing, etc. So the point of departure for the exploration of the device, because that's one thing, I have a tool, but where do I start? So it was, as a generator, was, uh, of what we call, I call the 21st century liquid landscape, liquid landscape was the work of Roberto Bullemar, that I always admire. In particular, his expansive transdisciplinary practice. Uh, Bullemar is considered not just Latin America's most influential landscape architect, but one of the most important figures of the 20th century. A multi-talented artist trained as a painter, a musician, he practiced in multiple media, including drawing, painting, etching, sculpture, mosaics, tap tapestry, uh, stage design, and uh, this thing is not working. Yeah, the, oops, how do I go back? Um, I wanted to show that. Uh, Beautiful bracelet. Gold <laughs> bracelet. Yeah. Okay. So I also like the scale of this device. <laughs> and um, so you know, once we discussed in depth the work of this you know, pluri-talented uh, artist and architect, we were ready to proceed into our so uh, I want to show you just this as an opening example of what our devices look like. Mm -hmm. It's not quick time problem. It's problem. 
because you don't have quick time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we won't see. <laughs> so anyway, this is basically. You don't have to I have it in my computer. It's going to be too long. It's very funny so, because these are three students who couldn't uh, come here, so they sent a video. And uh, so there are these three students saying, and look, and this, and that, and then they show how they transform their flamingo part into a device. And they totally changed the idea. They, because they said the flamingo part was landfill, didn't exist. So they went and did another landfill, and then worked it as a number of islands that moved. So anyway, so it's kind of like a funny video. So I, I think some you saw it. You've seen it because I showed it here. And I'll guess I'll show it. But anyway, the, um, so the question is that making the device totally changes the dynamic of the studio because suddenly it becomes this kind of arts and crafts atelier because every student read everything about wool and art. Some decided to produce tapestry, some decided to do something else. So as you can see, this is, doesn't look like an architecture studio. And I wanted you to see how the, the theater of, of, of operations is totally changed. And, you know, including music, etc. And then different case studies. So, um, so one was the color puzzle. So this one student decided to look into color, theory of color, etc. And transform uh, some of Wooler Marx's paintings into a puzzle. So this is the puzzle. Uh, this is the these are the students presenting it, and all the pieces were in that box. So they are very simple operations. Okay? Uh, a viewing device. Okay? Uh, because obviously the question was not just the object, but the perception of the object. So they decided to work on that perception. And uh, here this shows how they produced with always using color, uh, the colors that Wooler Marx used. In a particular painting, create something completely different. And uh, this is at the right, on the right side, you see the image that they produce. And here, they also produced a booklet explaining like an IKEA manual, okay, which was one of the last things. So, uh, step four, step five, step six, and they incorporated in a number of exercises their iPhone. So um, step seven, step eight, that's what they do at the end of So as you can see, then also it's not about designing buildings anymore, and it opens up a number of new questions. So this is, for instance, the booklet that I asked them to design for that particular device. Uh, and then I'll show you very quickly, this looks into moving into the park with the pinball machine. Okay. Or, <coughs> for instance, the Google and Mark CTO transformed into a Rubik's Cube. So they, so they had the catalog of all the plant things, and then they played with new combinations that departed from the original syntax of the Rubik's Cube. And here is their manual explaining what they could do with the Rubik's Cube. And for instance, this is something very, very different. This is like the children pop-up books. So they produced that, you know, there were all these folders that they could open up, as you could see on the right hand side. So the element of play was always there, and I didn't give any instructions, I mean, we showed examples, but basically it came really from the students. Um, so uh, now we also looked at Iberacuera with this idea of device. So before going to the urban device, that is the one we developed once we visited San Miguel, Billings, and, uh, and the Seages. So this was transforming the, the marquees and all the buildings into a gym. So, you know, in Princeton many times the students 
do half day study and half day spend during the vigil or doing sports. So this group, which was basically the jobs at, at that time, that year, uh, decided to do an amazing gym. You could see the book they produced, okay? Ibira Fit. Okay? So, so uh, well, humor was really very important part of the studio. And then here, they're basically showing their brochure, okay? And uh, then, you know, for instance, uh, they want to have the idea of generating a different Ibirapura with a device made out of mirrors. So they inspired in this painting, they created this model with mirrors, or a uh, tapestry, okay? Which was this, okay? Um, a loom, produced with a loom, a virtual reality device, uh, which is this, yeah? and uh, you could see on the right hand side, uh, based on the original photographs, how the images were transformed, this is in the process of making them, okay, this is basically they created a, a virtual reality tour of Ibirapuera, this is the final review, Another VR device. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so this is just to give you an idea of what that first stage, which was the development of the device itself, as a forming the apparatus, applying the apparatus to, to the park. Uh, and now we're going to see what happened when we visited the different sites. Uh, so San Miguel Paulista in 2013, you can see here, <clears throat> the area that we visited, one of the buildings they liked, the very large tree they were fascinated with, and then, uh, you know, different places in San Miguel, and one first project we they call heat hydra structures, okay? which was basically a way of uh, combining a promenade along the river, which going down on the river, so it was more like a, a topological idea where you flow from one level to the other. And uh, you can see here the Red Plus, uh, a place for uh, a kind of a theater, amphitheater next to the river. And you can see the, how they, with those ramps, how they flow from one level to the next. So um, then this is called Eco Fictions. Eco Fictions. I'm not going to go into the detail, but these are like artificial islands that are all processing, you know, different way of conceiving the processing plants of the, not just in land, but in the water itself. itself. And uh, the idea of floating islands of water, not of land. Okay, and you can see the section of the island. Okay. So that's why I'm saying that there are like new ideas in, that appear not, not just in plan but in sections. Uh, obviously, there, yeah, uh, super swamp, which is basically letting the the Tiete flow overflow and producing a swamp yeah. and making it a park. Obviously, with uh, promenade on the dockies. Uh, this is perhaps one of the most advanced. Uh, the, one of the students was a dancer, and she decided that she wanted to do something absolutely related to the body. And uh, you can see the detailing here of what these internal spaces are. So basically, there is water flowing everywhere in this project. You know, it's kind of more like an extreme fantasy of what you would do. Uh, and. Uh, and then this is called what are you doing? <laughs> uh, which is a uh, yeah, an amazing uh, project, I must say, because it is literally a water park, but it doesn't look like a water park. You can see, okay? It's like so they are all ramps, but it, they are all inside this incredible structure. So um, and they combine not just water, but actually steam which they say is never being used in water parks. So I thought that that was really a very powerful idea <coughs> because also in terms of vision, it would create those you know, steamy areas that I thought. So anyway, you know, for 
as I'm saying, for me, this was a possibility of stretching the limits of the way we deal with water. This is the flow of the final review, which you know, basically we are all looking at brochures. So the next year, living reservoir were in the artificial lakes in the south of Samoa. So the students were, uh, well, it was amazing as a place. Okay? But they were particularly impressed with this, <laughs> with the pollution beyond description, and also with the fact that we've seen kids swimming. And they were totally horrified. So that impressed them so much that most of them developed water purification projects mixed with other programs, so, um, which I thought was super interesting because they were not just schools and water purification or markets, but they were one thing. So, um, so for instance, this is an inflatable urban device. Okay? And he called it Oscuros, okay? the inflatable fluvial metropolis. And here he explains what is a Kubo. The Kubo is basically an inflatable space. I can read into this, but it's a space for many different types of actions. So, uh, and it's, I, I would say from now on, that's the leitmotif for the studios. They, the students are totally conscious that what they're designing are not buildings anymore, but they're designing what we would call stages for social action. So they have to basically, the idea is that pushing the boundaries of the stage will somehow reverberate in the way the social actions and programs, etc., are structured. So it's like a very old-fashioned idea in architecture. They change shapes of forms and it influences behaviors. So you'll see that it's not just behaviors, but the potential of new combinations of uses. So they have different typologies that depend on single individuals in small groups that could be a family, a group of friends, etc., or large group of people. So that defines the three kubos. And then, uh, you see, it's, which are small, medium, and large. And uh, this is the difference between occupable space, external boundaries, and water filtration system, because they are all water filtration. So it, so it shows here the roof is a solar panel. Then, uh, you know, the, there are docking poles, because they float. Uh, there, there is a water filtration system and then a support structure. Okay. So, um, so how do you go around with these different types of transportation? You know, small boats, larger boats, etc. And then different age groups see activities differently. See, that's where the script comes in. And there is an event schedule for every day of the week from 6 in the morning to 10 p.m. So the projects are not just about space. Now they're organizing entire schedules for the full day and the full week. So you can see here, open to the public, uh, swimming classes, open to the public, see, because they're all obsessed with the idea of swimming now in clean water. And then you could see water zamba, swimming classes, uh, okay, dancing workshops, etc. Okay, so it's really about fun. And here you have, on Saturday, community meetings, open sports play, family picnics, that's weekends, okay? Volleyball, basketball, temporary art installations on Sundays, etc. So this is a full program for the week with special attention to weekends. And here, a uh, catalog of what will happen with the different entries. So you have 3 to 12, uh, you know, recreation, swimming classes, leisure, weekly movie, family picnics, live bands, sports bands. Blah, blah blah, learning opportunities, arts and crafts. Okay? So it's a full program, it's almost like a CESC that even expanded, okay? And which they learned when they went to the CESC campaign. And then uh, ages 2, 12 to 21, uh, now it gets more and more complex and sophisticated, 21 to 50. And obviously for the students, older people, 50 plus. Okay? So um, for them, almost like retirement. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> okay. So here, weekly movie, live dance, port concert, temporary art installations. That's what it's like. Older than 50, you don't move anymore. You don't dance. You don't go to the gym. 
So here, what does a day at Los Cubos look like? And here, the description, because it's all mixed. And okay, here, this is a diagram showing the coexistence of the different groups doing different things during different times, during different days of the group. So you can see also the graphics definitely relate to cartoon graphics. It's not anymore architectural. Okay. And um, yeah. okay. and uh, now all combined, and this is one possibility of a number of different possibilities. Okay. 6 p.m. to 12 a.m., so it goes to midnight. Okay, and this is the location of Los Cubos in, in the site. Okay. And this is a close-up of Los Cubos in relationship to the, okay, because they're all in flow. I mean, they're all in the water. So, okay, project number two. This is not as developed, but it's kind of interesting because this is actually floating, you know, submer half submerged. So it's that thing here, okay, this little thing here. And this is what it looks like. And this is more like an artist student. Okay. And this is basically, you see, this is all like half submerged, half clothing. Okay, this is actually a student from art and archaeology, so it's a lot more artistic, we could say. And she was incredibly impressed with uh, this, it's one of the photographs, that this was the photograph that inspired her project, which is really a beautiful image. So she first uh, went back to, uh, oops. Which can sell up here. So, um, I thought it didn't. Well, it's uh, 600 megawatts, so it might get that. So this is her device, uh, which was like a, you could see the scale, it was, she built this closet in the hallway of the school that was like 12 feet tall, okay, and where she put all the images of, the, of her project. Okay. That's the way she presented it. And then she started with, um, with this idea from puzzle to item the translation of her device. And then she basically used the puzzle to organize the islands. And then uh, you see some of the islands disappear to make internal lens, you could call them. And some move away and some change in section, actually, you see. And they're half submerged or not. So she experimented a lot with that. But then also with uh, bio phyto, uh, what do you call that? Cleaning? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so this explains what these, some of these islands will be. But she also wanted some to be like leisure, very special, surreal places. So she decided to just start working with two of them. And this is basically her rendering of these really beaches. You know, like small beaches, they are floating on the bed. So that's, you know, a more poetic project, which I'm totally encouraged. And then this is more like, uh, this guy was very interested in Cedric Price and in the fan palace. So she des he decided to do a hydraulic fan palace uh, where the pieces were moving with water. So the water there was all about hydraulic elevators, moving pieces of this fan palace. So this is the building, okay? and this is the section. And you can see how things move. I mean, there are theaters, there are different pieces there. And uh, you know, he explains here the different internal apparatuses and how they work. And uh, I mean, this is, really view, I think, a beautiful project, more engineer, I would say, than other projects. And you can see swimming pools and fields, etc., all in this hydraulic fan palace. 
Now this is a water plant plus beach, another combination. So uh, this it's that little circle there. Okay. So this one and this one. So uh, so this is the project. Okay, you could see the swim pool and the plant, the pure plant. It's not realistic, but it looked good, so I thought why not. And uh, okay, so you could see there. You can also obviously play on the water purification plant. And on the other hand, so you have the the water being cleaned that goes to the swim. Okay, and you can see here the swim, which is another case of obsession with swimming in clean water. And then this uh, David White, who thought, well, why not collect rainwater? So his project was all about water collection. So this is basically all the machines he invented for water collection. Okay. So uh, you can see, he basically spent, he didn't design any architecture, just water collecting machines, except that he created a kind of tent, water collector tent, as a public space, which is this, which is quite beautiful. So it's both a public space, but in principle, also a machine to collect. And of course, purification, which I'm not showing you because some of those uh, devices were about purifying the water. Now, the final one, CHS. Well, there we dealt with a gigantic canopy, which is what this, my students now here were going to be dealing with in the this year project again. I mean, I love that structure, and I thought that it would be very appropriate for students who never had architecture before, so they wouldn't have to worry about a roof, which requires a little bit of knowledge. So they don't have to worry about water falling on their own sorry. So they could be open structures. So, um, so here I'm just going to show you a, a couple of projects and I'm done. So this is the CHS inside, which is quite an amazing space. And uh, this is what I'm just going to show you a couple of projects. So this is David Fisher, um, who comes from San Francisco and he discovered this historical building, a swimming center in San Francisco at the turn of the 20th century, which inspired him to convert the CHS into a swimming center, the way the swimming center worked in San Francisco. So it's a very different idea of water. So besides the fact that the CHS is next to water, so, um, so as it says here, it's everything, okay? And he's also, an athlete, and he's now in the Marine Corps. <laughs> you not from Princeton. He worked. I hope they don't send him to Afghanistan. So anyway, so this is his project called the Platforms, and uh, this is what he developed. I'm not going to get into detail what he developed, but you could see also you see this jogging ring that there are many, many different types of possible activities which he describes here in this, which is actually as a representation, he used the uh, old American city maps as a, a model for representing the building. In America, Christine knows very well, cities were represented with a plan and different views with this type of representation, so he used that. And I mean, he was kind of interested in history, and that's why he looked at the San Francisco model, and here he describes, which is quite nice, you know, a, a three stories, a mother who comes with his son for a swimming lesson, and all the activities that she can perform while she waits for his swimming lesson, meeting friends, going to the cafe, uh, you know, there are also special places for women, etc. And then uh, the senior citizen, which you know, that's I'd say, from the perspective of a 20-year-old, this must be like a 40-year-old guy <laughs> who can barely walk. And then, uh, so he comes with his wife and meets friends and they go to a restaurant because there is also a restaurant and he walks on that ramp, he can jog, he can walk, which is good for his osteoporosis. And then <laughs> the athlete who runs and plays sports, etc. So those were three, three and three stories. And who pays and who doesn't? So, well, he said the athlete is the only one who doesn't pay. 
So, anyway, and then this is basically a more elaborate story that starts with water scarcity. You remember the draft here? So he was impressed with that. This is his project. I'll go back to that. But it's basically a, a water plant. He transformed the entire project into a water treatment plant, but also with public social functions. So it's a mix of water plant and social function. So it's, but, so, but he said it's actually purification of water and purification of the body. So there are different activities. It's almost like a spa for the body, and very sophisticated spa, and then a, a, a purification of the water. So he starts with the story of scarcity. You know, 14% of the world fresh water is in Brazil, and uh, the drought was an 80-year drought, and he was very impressed. 12% of Cantaregra is, you know, it's most of it depleted. Uh, daily water cuddles in, in Sao Paulo. I mean, they were very impressed with that story. So he goes to the site of the CHS and then describes the, the canopy. And then basically he gets inspired by all these pictures and he starts to translate the purification plan into architectural potential in terms of, you know, formal, uh, for, formal uh, ideas. So he takes, goes from these into his project, and uh, somehow these become part of his project, which you can see here. I'm not going to get into the detail, but all those pieces are here. And then, uh, actually, the first two represent the purification of the body, because there are plantings, there are you know, aromatherapy, there are genes, there are things going on. So he describes two different people. One is the nerd who is interested in the mechanical aspects of the project, and the other one is the, he calls it the biological, the nature enthusiast, is interested in learning in the therapeutic, therapeutic benefits of walking, observing the flora and fauna. She engages, it's a woman by the way, in with a treatment plan by purifying her own body through the herbs and vegetables in cigarettes. So, um, uh, just a few more slides because another thing that we invented with this with these studios is the idea of having exhibitions of the studio material in a new exhibition space in one of the colleges in Princeton, Butler College. So we started that year a series of exhibitions and uh, we made uh, design posters. Okay, this was the first one. This explains what the studio was. This is the actual show. Okay. These are the students admiring themselves. <laughs> okay. And the beautiful photographs they took. This is the, the you know, it's the roof of the Copan building. And uh, she's admiring one of the projects, the one with the water islands, because we had the mobiles. And in the background, you see someone from a building next to us, which is the School of Department of Music, the School of Music, because we got the kid to play as a DJ in Brazilian music, <laughs> as a band. Okay. So uh, these are, yeah, it's another one of the projects, viewing devices, the puzzle, the, <coughs> the cube, Rubik's cube, and then this is the next year, which we just had posters. So the same thing you've seen now in the form of the poster. So I'm just showing you a few, okay? And this is the, the hydraulic museum. So this is basically what I wanted to show you. What you can see is that actually we, there, there was a definitely, definite effect in our teaching, in the type of questions that we raised, but also in other activities that somehow we generated uh, inspired by this project. Thanks. Now, what I would like to show you now it is this because, no, I, I mean, very informally, but I mean to say this sketch could be. I don't know when or should yeah. made the sketch, but it could be in lines one when he started the master 
program at Paul's Week. And to me, it's amazing that he could uh, transform this in a lifelong talk of research. And you know, something that is being uh, like reverberation since that time in different uh, ways. And that for him is a very challenging uh, work. And I, I, I think that I have a kind of explanation because it is uh, too vast that doesn't fit in a master uh, format, in a PhD format. In a, so it is something that just uh, find uh, or fit in a proportion like this that we are living now, you know, with a lot of people talking, like reverberating. So this is, and so I have been seeing this kind of uh, talking through those sketches since 91, so it's very special to be here today. And this, uh, to say there was a time, uh, it was in, sorry for showing, no, that's okay. it is, I think that 2014, no, there was a lot of sun, and I used to no, we, we are very lucky. Christina Lane at that point was the vice dean of our architectural school. Just on family. When Mario, Mario came by the first time, and uh, so it is really special this program uh, because I think that we are going to be able after four years uh, to produce something that show uh, a proposal in the way that it can. Uh, how fruitful it could be in, in through this publication and that would be everything but very very meaningful and then this that is our <laughs> yeah our cat cat. Cat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so nice I, I, I don't know if you have any other teacher yeah, yeah. please because much better than mine no and, and uh, this is your teacher yes <laughs> So, but today uh, I, I'm supposed to comment a little bit, but I'm comment the, the presentation by the two protagonists of this process, so Alexander Jacob and, and Mario. Uh, so I, I think that is very nice the way you both present because you brought a very organized sequence of talks, of images, of, and, and Mario uh, made, a, again, no surprise in this, with, uh, well, Le Corbusier, in those two moments, 29 and 36, uh, of course, that Le Corbusier is here also. No? Yeah. It's a key figure for <laughs> But here, no, he was the person that was chosen by Lucy Costa to, to be the, like the mentor uh, in the foundation moment of modern architecture in Brazil. Uh, but uh, particular his, his trip in 29 uh, was very also meaningful for for us because that those two sketches that I just looked two that he made for Sao Paulo. I didn't show them. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted to talk about water. Yeah. <laughs> but and I, I thought that the yeah. Sao Paulo or Sao Paulo is yours. <laughs> no, but he mentioned sure. about water. Oh, yeah. In a way, because the valley and the yeah. other thing. Uh, but it is, what I, I think that could be also nice that I could try to do is, is at that moment, uh, and 
taking the trip, the first trip in 29, exactly at the same moment when he was sketching those two, yeah. not exactly proposal, <coughs> but those two sketches. Uh, at that same year, Precious Maya was designing a proposal for Sao Paulo, covering all the rivers uh, with atoms. No? Uh, no? No, Plano de Avenida. A Yanga Baú was over. The result was over. A Yanga Baú was completely closed by Fresh Slater. And it became the mayor. The plan was only different. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. I have to, uh, no, no I, I have to learn a little bit, but I am about that I meet the image that I have in mind. There was no river in I am about. And that the bridge, the buildings that was published in 1930, uh, uh, when he published the, the, the Plan of Jovenitas. So, but what is, uh, and then he was this, Figure, you know, that he was a uh, very important professor. He's a professor, uh, he was professor of uh, Vila Nova Artiga, and Vila Nova Artiga has always mentioned Precious Maya with uh, a lot of respect. To but, uh, and, and he was very successful, he was mayor of the city two times. But I, 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 what I think that's very interesting is that in one hand we, we had the proposal by Le Corbusier that didn't build uh, directly anything he, he came in 21 to, to design Brazil and Plan at that point. Uh, and, and then Precious Maya, that was a very successful man. But Le Corbusier was very uh, like maybe successful in a way, shaping uh, the way we think on architecture. But these two projects were completely detached from, and, and, and maybe they, they start to be linked much more recently. To me, it's very important, a proposal made by Villanova Artigas in the beginning of the 80s as a kind of synthesis between these two worlds. But I think that maybe the hydronel could be much more uh, important to represent this kind of synthesis, no? And our way to think and our, uh, and the way that we could uh, build the, 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 the city. So that's why I, I liked very much the fact that I brought <laughs> the museum. But uh, besides what I, I think that's very meaningful is when you, you showed us the, the proposal made by, by the students. No, 2013. Uh, São Miguel Paulista, 14, Pino Ororé, and 15, or, or CIGES. 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 No, 15. 15, CIAGES. So, because it's, uh, 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 that to me is also really important, is, is how the proposal by Alexandre uh, can provoke in our way, yeah. you know, our imagination and mostly students' uh, imagination, you know, the, and then like it uh, produced this kind of result that there is a way that make a uh, kind of uh, bring to me a very optimistic uh, feeling know that in the end this kind of thing uh, will be happening because we have no way to 
to, to avoid. But there are one thing that I, I, I'm, I, I'm, trying, I, I'm trying to to highlight some points that to me seem very important in the process, I mean, in these three or four years of this program. Now, the first is the sequence of our workshop. Now, the first one, history, the second one, engineer, third, mention that, more or less, so I, I will mention more like by memory, but uh, the third metropolitan yeah. position, uh, the fourth imagination, and the fifth now art. As a so the first history, I was linking this with uh, a little bit with Milton Santos, because the first history is pretty much the, the, the formal and normative approach. The second the engineer is the technical approach. The imagination, art, is the symbolic approach uh, that Milton Santos described as the three fields where, where we can act on, on, on the space. You know? The metropolitan, that is, uh, corresponds to our, it's much more a condition, maybe, than, than a field or than an approach. Uh, and, and I think that's very uh, good to keep uh, those points in mind because I think that it makes very clear what we are going to have from now that is the finishing of the publication organized in a way that could be very... Uh, so, and I, I now going back a little bit to, to the presentation of this morning. But uh, all this meaning, you know, when you mention the word water, you know, that you, so the water as an element, I mean, uh, drinkable, uh, the, 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 the very crucial uh, source precondition to the city, or, or water as a way, if we think about uh, to navigate or for boats or as a tool to solve, to cook, to, to cut uh, material, to cast. Uh, no water that we use in concrete and concrete, uh, by the way, is uh, ice, uh, steam uh, we use, uh, but and also as, as landscape. Uh, no, and then the, the last image is by Alexandre, you know, or uh, rivers, streams, creeks, or lakes, and shore, or uh, the river mouth, the, the artificial river mouth that you showed us. I think that it is, uh, the, the, the way it appears, it, it's very, I think it's very important that in, in so different ways, because water in our history and tradition is everything that we have been disregarded all the time. So it's uh, the back of the city is the, and uh, we won't have any way to keep going without changes approach. So what I, I think that is a very, uh, like to me is like a lesson and I, I, I look back and I can see the persistence of Alexandre de Vivacor is how he has been all the time looking for those uh, parts of the city, those approach that we, we dismiss uh, historically all the time. So I think that it is a turning point in our uh, approach in our and uh, right to to close. I one thing that we talk uh, very often 
and uh, I'm always very worried, you know, with the proportion of this project, you know, the, uh, I mean, the scale. Uh, because I, I saw a couple of times that it could be like uh, very, not easily, but very often misunderstood as a top-down approach and this kind of. And I think this is a, a very important point that I might have since the beginning understood in a very uh, good way. Because it's, it's right the opposite, you know. It's, it, it was just, uh, or it was exactly through the approach brought by Alexander Jacob that I, I learned the names of a uh, lot of space in Sao Paulo, you know, Tayasso Pepe, or Kukutu. Uh, that that uh, is like uh, a condition that we had in here much before the process of urbanization. So it is a way to recognize the identity of different places that make the metropolitan region of Sao Paulo. And so, and then it, it, uh, it becomes very clear how it is completely the, the opposite, like the, the bottom-up uh, way to, to allow things to emerge. You know, this I, is what I, I I think that's very good, important to be considered, you know, because clarify a point that I think that's very, very good. So it's not exactly a question, but just to bring some more points. Do you have any questions for us? The, the question of well, what I, I, I suppose that what I, Christine, uh, I have a comment on, on to, I had a diagram that I started working on while you were talking, <laughs> and then I finished it. So maybe you'll disagree with me, but I think the two of you talking about exactly the same thing. I think it's the mentality that you didn't really stress. So I began to say, um, but my first book, the first chapter, is on the planning mentality. <laughs> And I was thinking, who was I influenced by to call mentality at that time, decades ago? And I was looking at Rodel and the Mediterranean and the mentality, because the Annals School used the term mentality, um, of all the things that went together to create the Mediterranean, all about water, all about mountains, all about ridges and changing of elevation. And, and then I began to write down, well, what did I think planning mentality was? Well, it was vision, it was ideas, it was construction, it was concepts of language, because I'm particularly interested in language, and it was political, it was technical, it was social, it was everything you need to talk about the water grid, the way you talked about it. You were talking today about very specific elements that would go into it, but you did say the infrastructure of mentality was the title of it. So then I began to think of Le Corbusier. Well, I went to, to Michel Foucault first, because um, because of the mentality, because he too was looking in the 60s at Brodel, and he was also looking at Lucien Goldman, a, a philosopher who was talking about mentality too. So concept formation, discourse, language, it all came out of that. So I, I went to, to say, okay, from the water ring to Michel Foucault, and then I began to think of, before you spoke, of Le Corbusier, because the viaduct is a water right. Bringing, but the water that he was talking about was also transportation, but flow. And then again, I thought of Michel Foucault because biopolitics is all about circulation. It's all about the city, and he uses the example of Lille, where the breaking down of the walls in the 17th century, allowing circulation of the economy and goods, allowing circulation of people, and you know, cleansing the city. Of, of diseases and so on. So, but long before you had brought up the Kurdish, I was thinking about this link between the water ring and Michel Foucault, and then I got to Le Corbusier. And then you did just the reverse. You went from Le Corbusier yeah. to Michel Foucault and the apparatus um, uh, to the water ring and all of the influence. So, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that you, it's really incredible, but very beautiful work by the students, but also, you know, inspired obviously by. You know, so that was going to be my comment about how this sort of circle from one direction to the other ties very much these, this, this uh, mentality 
of the circulation of water. We can live without water. We can, you know, and also just opening up the city to that circulation, whether we're talking about 17th century, whether we're talking about the Mediterranean, whether we're talking about uh, Sao Paulo and the, and the water ring. It's, it's a, a very rich history and vision and uh, implementation, hopefully. You know, um, <clears throat> what's also interesting is the fact that, uh, I mean, th I mean, there was, uh, you could say, with uh, this project, love at first sight. Okay, because I came here without knowing anything about uh, about Uspi, about I didn't know about I knew about Angelo, but I didn't know about Alexandre. And when Angelo came to Princeton. He said, you absolutely have to talk to Alexandre. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, you remember, I was directing Cali at that time. Mm -hmm. So we did the, uh, the mobility workshop, then we did the energy workshop, mobility was in Princeton, energy in Shanghai, and then we did the water infrastructure workshop, and actually Anthony already participated, and I don't even remember it was that 2000. Eleven. 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 <laughs> so we did that in parts, and it was an absolutely fantastic. I mean, that for me, that was a revelation, and we said we have to expand. That. So in 2012, we did our second water workshop in Los Angeles, and uh, it was that year that I was working on the uh, possibility of a partnership between. And, Uspi. and uh, I came here actually with Ian Patash. It was something just to explore things. And then we sit down with Alexandre, and he says, This is what I'm doing a water infrastructure project, which is actually totally coincided or overlapped with the work I was doing. So that's what I'm saying. It was really like, uh, you know, like a lottery, I would say. For me, because I was, Princeton was pushing for me to get this project going, and somehow I discovered that I could continue with the water experience. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, actually, uh, Anthony has been my companion all these years, I should say, <laughs> because you know, not the since Paris, Los Angeles, uh, the presentation in seminars in Princeton, your presentation here in the second workshop. So what I'm saying is that there is definitely a parallelism in an overlap that's very lucky yeah, in a way. But, but it's also, uh, that's why I said what I said at the beginning, that with this project, I realized that we could definitely, with all the previous work, that water was the key issue, and that we don't need to talk metaphorically anymore about flowing cars and stuff because it's actually just the opposite. We don't want the cars to flow anymore. We want them to stop and we want to start or to slow down and you know start walking, start biking, start moving with public transportation so we can text <laughs> and not get killed texting while we drive. So anyway, so and that's when I wrote the slow infrastructure piece. So anyway, so what I'm saying is that I feel that this has been a, a, an incredibly productive field for research for me, personally. Yeah, but uh, it, it, it's more than a pieces, no? because I think that yes. you both were in the uh, very crucial uh, points no, as a, for research. I mean, the, the, the how to deal with all this, the, the city is bringing more than 70 members uh, in this region that completely disregard the things. Very difficult to translate to the American context, I must say. And the only possibility that I saw, well, <coughs> Christine has also been working with Poland for a while, and you did the New Orleans thing in a way, but. Uh, the only place where I could see the possibility is actually in Los Angeles, and that's why we brought in the subject. 
but again, it's enormously difficult because if I was thinking of a dream of a project that requires a very heavy uh, hand from the government side, which we know now, even if California would succeed, <laughs> yeah, which exactly they want. I don't think in America you could. I mean, we're not never going to go back to Tina say to you know to the Roosevelt era. But in fact, in Brazil, in Latin America, I think you can still think of that. And obviously, the hydroanel is something that you cannot do with a private sector. That is, you could incorporate private sector into a project like that. But it's a multi-billion dollar project that requires a heavy hand and government intervention. To talk about a kind of metrics to approach the what we mean is the infrastructure of mentality. That is a metrics if we have the idea of an ethical, ethical, ethical foundation, uh, technical structure, and quality shelter. Mm. This matrix is, uh, has a transversal axis uh, of the approach with the place, the problem, and the construction. Place, problem, and construction is, uh, is built by a qualitative way, qualitative way. Different people together from bottom to up, yeah. Yeah. from a dialectical approach, uh, made uh, this uh, idea of the place, uh, the place understand as social, as social space, as learning space, a uh, space to become. We together can become another. We but can that reinvent and then the mentality is the, the right of the, the, the right to think of liberty no? without uh, afraid, no? without any kind of uh, afraid. No? This is a way to, to understand. Uh, we stay in the reality is that, of course, it's a political and political start. We stay and live together with different people. And which is why I, I try to put in English, my poor English, maybe the idea. You know. Of course, the language, you know, we think. Uh, Portuguese, uh, English, German, but the reality is this uh, ethical and political approach of uh, humanity, social, quality, uh, this, this idea of the human uh, land without home.
thus far the other relationship between the different people and try to live together. Mm. <coughs> um, no, I guess it's, it's interesting what you just brought up because it kind of it goes back to a number of issues that we brought up this morning. <coughs> I wanted to ask you because it, you see in America, for instance, the ownership of land next to the water is different from that in many other countries. Yeah. And uh, it depends on the east or west coast. The east or west coast, that's true. Yeah, because they you can't coast. own land no, you can't. Yeah. on the waterfront on the east coast. Exactly. It's public. It's public. You can't pass that was going to ask you, and in Brazil it's public as well, isn't it? Yeah. No, even, even the papers, but the law came later. Uh, no, even the, the, all yeah. the avenues uh, along the... They, they preceded the law. They're not, they're not law. Yeah. Yeah. Wooden. Yeah. I don't know how yeah. to solve them. Yeah. When I talk that uh, the was to turn the position of the urban highways that confine the, the, yes. the river to the rivers, and propose, I propose to the transformer it's a good of the river with the speed, massive speed of 30 km per hour, with particular speech at 200 meters. <laughs> Opposite is yeah. another kind of mentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the the, the That's lower than Princeton. Princeton is 25 miles, which is like 37.5 kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, if you drive in Princeton, it's rather confusing. <laughs> so, uh, what do we want to do? Uh, do we want to break or do we want to speed over into the Final session because it's actually mm, 4:15. Maybe Christina and Christine will continue with this conversation, and we close. <laughs>
how to summarize, and I'm actually speaking to all of you, but you're sitting in back of me. <laughs> well, maybe so you can move. Yeah, maybe you can move. Okay. Here, here. <coughs> and that's super bad. So the task was to summarize all of the workshops, five of them, and that's impossible for me because I haven't attended all the workshops. So I was given, uh, how come nobody else smashed into this? <laughs> anyway, I was given um, two volumes of the summary, which they were just discussing whether it's a Portuguese version of it or not, and, and how to collect everything. And I, I was also given the abstracts of the workshops that I didn't attend, so I put everything together and uh, had a summary of what I thought had gone on. Of course, you're going to say no, that's not what went on, but I had uh, you know, a summary, and then I began to think, what, what's, kind, what's, what's itching me? What, what's, what's the trouble uh, that I want to stay with? And I think that I, uh, there's a book that uh, Donna Haraway has come out with recently called Staying with the Trouble. Yeah, it's good. And so I thought of this water ring as staying with the trouble. <laughs> that uh, water is trouble. Um, that all of the difficulties of how to bring the water back into the city is trouble. Um, how to think even of this ring all around this incredible, is, is trouble. And staying with the trouble, not giving up. Is, is really important and bringing, why, why I like the word mentalite or apparatus if you want, is that uh, it really is a diagonal line across strat of, uh, a geological stratification that like I would have talked about that brings all of this together, all the difficulties, all the elements that have to be considered. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I began to uh, think about what what is it that troubles me, but also you know what is it what was the workshop trying to get at, and so um, I think that Mario has explained very well that the original project or idea behind this comes from um, the Idron Anel, if I pronounce the 170 kilometer long waterway ring around Sao Paulo, and that's the project. That's what's your studios have stayed with, and, and that's uh, the problem. So it, let me see if I can actually get the right document here, because um, in traveling, I seem to have left the first page of my remarks. So anyway, I began to think uh, how, now wait a minute, let me just get my right page here, OK. All right, All right so the workshop number one, March uh, 2015 uh, in Princeton was the Fluvial Cities Past and Future. And I looked at a quote, and I'm going to read out the quote because this is what sort of I thought that workshop was about. It's by uh, Mather and Kunha about waters everywhere uh, from a book that is designed in the terrain of water. So this is a quote I will read. Why is it that despite waters everywhere, precipitating, seeking, soaking air, soil, and vegetation, collecting in interstitches, pores, terraces, cisterns, and aquifers, evaporating, transpiring, and sublimating, water we see everywhere, somewhere, but it's confined within or behind lines and generally colored blue on maps. So I began to think lines. What better thing to think about in terms of drawing a line between water and land, the water ring, and that drawing of lines. So to me, the original purpose of that workshop was about uh, the drawing of that line. So you discussed uh, your vision of the Metropolitan Waterway Ring, which I think, again, you've talked a little bit more specifically about. And Christopher Baer, is that how you pronounce his name? He talked about the line, the elaborate network of tidewater routes and the canals that brought together the hinterlands and the metropoles in, on the East Coast 
uh, from Boston, Massachusetts to Norfolk, Virginia. So again, drawing a line, draw lines drawn between nodes in a network of commerce and transport, which spurred on the growth of the eastern cities. And I will go on about drawing the line. Um, the second workshop was the engineering of fluvial cities here in Sao Paulo, uh, same year, but uh, in November or end of October. And I was present to that one, so. Um, but I also began to think about another quote, this one by Kate Orff, um, who has recently published a book, uh, Toward an Urban Ecology. And here I take her quote. As we build cities, we have buried streams, we have filled in estuaries, we have dammed rivers, we have merged watersheds with sanitary sewer sheds, and we've replaced rainwater cycles with timed irrigation, exposing the physical parameters of water in the urban landscape. Where does it go? How is it absorbed? Where is it piped? Who is drinking it? Where is it being, quote, disposed, unquote, as a waste product? is all of this is revelatory and leads to potential new and potential spatial, positive spatial relationships that can link urban form with water programs. And so I think the second workshop was this engineering aspect that we've regulated the relationship between water and land by a series of engineering feats, of bridges, of aqueducts, of dams, of sluices, of hydroelectric generating stations that are works of art as much as they are engineering works. And yet, and yet an enormous gulf remains between the works of the engineers, the engineer planner, and the imaginary vision of water and landscape of the poet. And so the second workshop seemed to be to try to address this gulf between the engineering aspects, the planning aspects, and the visionary aspects of water and landscape. So I'm going to uh, sort of jump over uh, summarizing uh, Richard Toledo, uh, opened the discussion with uh, in the Sao Paulo's integrated urban water management plans. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Maria Thadio Lemmy de Barros continued by discussing flood control, and I discussed learning to live with water in New Orleans, and um, Anthony Achebati took up the Ganges River uh, basin to explore the development of cities and infrastructure along the line of the river Ganges. But the boundaries drawn between water and land were ever shifting as diesel power bore with uh, wells extracted ever more water from the land as salinization, you can tell me I'm totally wrong in, in summarizing, and water logging made land unfit for vegetation and urban settlements required greater amounts of drinking water and India is the largest user of groundwater in the world, making it essential to map these shifting lines where water flows, um, uh, where water transgresses the line and floods, where water soaks and saturated before it flows, where salinity and impurities lie. So very much for me drawing a line, but drawing a line on a map that's ever shifting boundaries and so forth. And then uh, Vladimir Bartolini continued on the theme of water and landscape, stressing the aesthetic dimension of aquatic spaces. And we, um, water as an instrument is seen time and it's important to experience landscapes that are both controlled and uncontrolled because where they're <coughs> controlled, that's where our imagination begins. That's where we begin to think and dream about water, what water might be, not controlling it, not putting it in a culvert, and, uh, but allowing it to infect us uh, with emotions. And then we move to the third workshop in which the uh, future guiding present uh, the future guiding present decisions in Sao Paulo and New York. That was uh, Princeton uh, a year ago, last April. Yeah. yeah, a year ago, 2016. So now I'm now I'm with Donna Haraway with Staying with the Trouble. So this is a quote from Staying with the Trouble. Uh, what it requires. Staying with the Trouble does not require a relationship to time called the future. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing point between awful or Edenic past and apolyptic or salvic futures, but as mortal crit critters entwined in myriad unfinished configurations of places, of times, of matter, 
of means. So staying with the trouble, the line drawn between water and land is a matter of inheriting the damages and achievements from the past and telling the tale of still possible recuperations. So I think, ooh, yes, that uh, this staying with the trouble was Christina. I wasn't here at the workshop, so I'm only abstracting what I think. I discussed the issues of planning of fluvial metropolis. And I think I'm just going to jump to say you ended your abstract, at least, with flows and porosities are the new metaphors created to describe metropolitan territories. It is flows that keep us from understanding the city as a totally apprehensible object and demand that we identify the connections and practices of the, excuse me, the metropolis's multiple forms of existence. So again, flows and lines, lines of history, uh, the current transformations of infrastructure and public spaces, and so on. Um, I wasn't there to hear Tom Wright, uh, pr uh, president of the Regional Plan Association of New York, and he gave no abstract, so you're going to have to fill in with what that was, but a colleague of his was there who talked about water as resource, water as threat in the New York City, um, and uh, what he seemed to be talking about is the impaired, polluted public waterways impaired for uses of swimming and fishing or drinking, so we have much the same problem in the metropolitan area of New York City or region of New York City with uh, the rising sea levels, uh, violent storms, extreme temperatures, flooding, and so forth. Um, I don't know if he left with um, anything to say about the future. Mitigation requires significant investments, changes in design, managed retreat from the floodplains, but he seemed to say, at least in the abstract, the troubles remain for the future to solve. Um, the future, no. It's staying with the trouble means something about the present and trying to work with that. So then we have the fourth workshop, which is Infrastructures of Imagination and New Theories of Tomorrow, which was again at Princeton um, last spring in April. And here we have Ilhelm, who was here this morning, uh, talking about the river as a force of integration, the third margin of development, um, and that water is essential. Um, but he also seemed to be talking about um, Paolo Mendes da Rocha. Yeah. Rocha? Rocha? Excuse me. I don't speak Portuguese. His building material is always concrete, and I had to go off and start looking for his work. And was looking for his quotes because I wanted to know why was he being discussed in uh, in infrastructure of the imagination about water, a fluvial river. So I, well, he seems to call his architecture working with liquid stone. So then I, I began to see that water is an essential part, and actually understand that his father built dams and bridges and 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 tunnels and water and so forth. So he had water from a, a, a brain from childhood, no doubt. Um, and so water is an essential part of his bus terminal in Sao Paulo, which we uh, saw, I think, the time we were here, by inverting the roof, allowing the water to trickle down and to flow into holes, and then not just to disappear, but to actually flow down the columns so that it becomes apparent and it isn't just misery that has gone away. So water becomes part of the urban scene. And uh, he calls da Rocha, I'm doing better. The founding trait of architecture, this is a quote from him, as an instrument for configuring the land. So again, I came back to the flow, the line that divides the water and land, and why water is so important. All space is public, he wrote. The only private space that you can imagine is in the human mind. The city has to be for everybody, no, not just for the very few. So then we heard things about the imaginary American rivers, um, and uh, we turned toward uh, Los Angeles, in which we began to discuss, or you began to discuss, uh, Jenny Price, who talked about who's Los Angeles, imagining the Los Angeles River, and certainly if that river is ever uh, released from its uh, concrete uh, calvary, it will flow through a diversity of neighborhoods. So then the question is, 
what will happen with those neighborhoods once the river begins to flow again? Um, is it going to be gentrification? Uh, who, for whom are those projects along a river front going to be for? And Hadley Arnold talked about divining dry lands, new tools for water sensitive uh, planning and design. Um, and it seemed to me that he then began to talk about sheep, Hadley, yes. sorry, yes. it wasn't there. The Arid Lands Institute yes. um, in uh, LA, and I began to go and look for the Arid Land Institute, what they had to say, and uh, basically Hadley and uh, Peter Arnold, yes, I do know it's a she now. Uh, water is more than its physical presence, it's about power, it's about survival, it's also about society and ecology. So I come back to staying with the trouble, staying with that line that is drawn between water <coughs> and land, um, and the very complicated series of discussions that you had in the workshops. And again, uh, I think we, we know what today was about and had good summaries of that, so let me just finish with that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no, 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 oh, don't, no, because, yeah, I wanted, to, my pages are out of order. I wanted to end with this, so let me return to Paolo Mendes de Rocha, statement that architecture is an instrument for configuring land, the drawing of lines on the surface of the earth, or lines laid down on a map, a building site, an engineer's drawing. And let me heed the late geographer Doreen Massey who feared that maps, or at least Western type maps, give the impression that space is a surface, that is the sphere of a completed horizontality. But a map is a space of a dynamic simultaneity, constantly waiting to be determined and therefore always undetermined by the construction of new relations. It is always being made and always therefore in a sense unfinished. If you really were to take a slice through time, it would be full of holes, of disconnections, of tentative half-formed first encounters. And so in the third workshop, I left it to the last, you, but you might not have been there, and it was um, <coughs> Bruno yeah. who spoke for you. Yeah. If the word metropolis in the 16th century designated a hegemonic vertical line drawn from the monarch and its subdued colonies, or the mother city and its dependencies, center, periphery, top and down. We haven't talked about the word metropolis, but now there it is. Then in contrast, the Sao Paulo water ridge is a horizontal line emerging from the specificities and coexistence of each site drawn together into a single chain in an anti-hegemonic metropolis, a river, a chain of reservoirs, lakes and canals in the watering of Sao Paulo are inconceivable without the drawn line. But what do these lines do? How do they channel the flow of water or traffic or commerce? Angela tells us that Alejandre knows every stream, creek, river, tracing the flow of water over time, guided by this flow. He brings to life forgotten names, places, and histories. He gaze, he, his gaze lands on issues of dredging sentiment. Sediment, sludge, garbage, rubbish, and to what might become if the streams, the creeks, the rivers were then allowed to flow again. If the line drawn between water and land were not thought of as a division, the line becomes one of extending time, connections yet to be made, potential links. They may never be established, but staying with the trouble, he enlarges our understanding of space and time related to the city of Sao Paulo and to the fluvial metropolis. There, I can <laughs> So, what I'm going to do is very, very brief, and I, will, I would like to talk about, uh, because we are now finishing our partnership. So this, I will not a partnership, but this, 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 Yes, so that we are going to have uh, the possibilities. So, but the, 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 the clo it closes the partnership between Carlos Piante uh, carried out in the last three years. And uh, I think that the way the activities were developed shows the correctness of our choices. 
we, we have a method that was built as the workshops and studios were held in Princeton and St. Paul. It looks like that we learn about with the experience of doing that. Uh, because it was, it, but it's not simple. That's what I wanted to do to talk today. Because it's not, we are very different institutions, very different institutions. They and Kawuspi, uh, but also the School of Architecture in Princeton and Kawuspi. But we we learn to talk, to to work together. So uh, and uh, I. The, the, the thing that I was very interested in to participate in this project is because it involves the students and professors also. So I, I think that we have to uh, to talk about this. What 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 are we doing? Uh, I, 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 will, I will talk a little, very little about how we speak. Next year, Augusti will be 80 years old. So, uh, but it's important to remark that Augusti, since the beginning in 1948, and became autonomous from the School of Engineering because first we had a, a course that was in the Polytechnic School, and in 48 we became a school. It it was. Uh, articulating the teaching of architecture and urbanism. And this was very new here in Brazil, and it's new, I think, in other countries also. And the, the, this model of articulating uh, uh, architecture and uh, urbanism was followed later by, by other schools in Brazil. Today, all the schools has architecture and urbanism at the same time. Not at the same time, <laughs> on the same way, but uh, they try to have this. And uh, I, uh, we had, uh, in the early 60s, we had a forum and a reform that assumed the commitment to the increasing complexity of architecture and urbanism education and included in the curriculum with equal importance history, design, and technology. I think that the Idranel uh, uh, has this complex, this complexity in, it, in the project of Idranel, the complexity of the education, of the with, of the architecture and urbanism of how USP is present in the project of Idranel. You see, we have technology as all the workshops were with professors of how USP. So we have engineer perspective, we have architecture perspective, we have urbanism, we have art, we have history of architecture, history of urbanism. So, I think that this is this complexity is present in the Idranel, but the main objective of the Idranel is to project architecture. This is so I think that this kind of thing is important to discuss and to think what are uh, what is the uh, what are we teaching in our schools? Uh, Mario brought three, uh, and, and now the fourth yep. group of students. And uh, each time with a new uh, challenge uh, issue to, to project it, Alexandre has an enormous group of students that work with him, that part of them are here, they are committed with him, as your students are committed with you. So I think that this is something that we have to, to think about and to talk about, even that we are so different schools. Uh, now, FAUSPI has, uh, will have until 2022, 50% of these students from public schools. It's, 
it, it, yes, they have to be from public schools. This, and they come from every part of uh, Brazil. So now we have another kind of students here, and we have to deal with this. That's a great challenge for all of us. So I propose that we talk a little bit yeah. about this. Now I am not going to. You have. A, you made it very well talking about every workshop. But I think that uh, our our partnership it's about this about, yeah, about learning teaching. about teaching. About teaching. That's it. Yeah. So yeah. I propose to open the discussion. Well, um, I would like to <coughs> follow up <coughs> by describing a very important difference between the tiny little school of architecture at Princeton University and the lar much larger school uh, uh, USP, but also the difference between Princeton University and USP, mm -hmm. perhaps that first. Because Princeton is a college, mm -hmm. and that's an institution that's eminently American. And that doesn't exist anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, our school, I would say, totally assumes this condition, the fact that we are part of the college. So we don't even talk about an architectural major properly because our students get a very general notion of architecture as a social science humanity type uh, discipline and uh, they have very few direct student studios and uh, we are, I would say, little by little work even diminishing the, the role of or the, the, the model of a traditional school of architecture mm -hmm. and making the school more college-like, more interdisciplinary. And that's why, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for the first time, we are teaching since the, I mean, we're much younger also, you're 80 years, we're 55. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is the first year where we are actually proposing a studio that it's totally in sync with the college because the students that you see here don't necessarily are going to be architects, they're actually majoring in other departments. And on the other hand, we feel that it's very important for us to disseminate uh, the knowledge of architecture and the discipline of architecture uh, to those other, I mean, it's, we feel it's been very confined. Still, even if we're not um, you know, one of those more uh, you know, professional mm -hmm. undergraduates. But then we do have a professional degree as well. Mm -hmm. That is meaning because actually from the uh, three programs, uh, I'm dedicated to the undergraduates. We have Christine is basically dedicated to everything. Christine is all over it. I mean, she's undergraduate, masters, and especially PhDs. But uh, well, okay. But um, within the masters program, there are still two programs, and only one of them is a professional. So it's it's minimal in terms of the scope of the entire school. And uh, in that sense, I would give you know, this what I said in my brief presentation is that the Zebra project gave me the possibility, the chance to start thinking what, first of all, a setting for a disciplinary seminar would be, which I started last year, mm -hmm. and uh, now what the interdisciplinary studio mm -hmm. so, uh, and so from the point of view of teaching, uh, we are changing the school, but we also feel that schools should change the way they teach architecture. So uh, I feel that it's, it's very important to, uh, to blur the, the boundaries and to uh, open up architecture. You know, for me, the idea would be that some of the students that come to this interdisciplinary studio 
come to architecture, but they have already tasted the, the, the social sciences of the humanities. And that some of them get a taste of architecture and go back to well, the social sciences, hopefully to business and their business and they become clients, or, so, or perhaps even political science and they will be in government giving the architects jobs. So, so in, in that sense, I think it's really important. I think that it's very important within the system, within, the, let's say, the American model to, to rethink how we teach. Well, maybe we should also open up the conversation yes. to the students because we have, you know, we have both the Princeton students here and the Uspi students. Hey guys, <laughs> three more Princeton students. Well, you know, while you put your thoughts together, I came over here so I could see you. I think that some of the experience of teaching in a large university as opposed to our small uh, school at Princeton, that the School of Architecture has been quite involuted, talking to itself. Architects tend to talk to other architects and like that most of all. But when you talked about the formation of this Pro, a program which has architecture and planning and, together. And urban. And urban. Yeah, right. urban. It's, it's, urban. Yeah. it's not in my well, it's it's the, the, We yes, won't debate. <laughs> yes, it's 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 sure. But, but uh, let's just talk about urbanism and architecture together. That doesn't exist in the United yeah, States in uh, schools of architecture. So there, that, there's a difficulty. So when you want to experiment with some ideas that are more than just formalistic and more than just uh, uh, section, elevation plan, and so forth, then you have to go to a large university where there is this, this understanding of how complex urban projects are. So you know, I think the interdisciplinary component is within your schools, but we need we need the rest of Princeton to invade the School of Architecture. Okay, yeah. I, really, I really mean it, because it's, it's yeah. a matter of the urban problems are so huge for the 21st century that if you aren't thinking about it from a multidisciplinary, policy-oriented, biologically-oriented, uh, politically-oriented, sociologically-oriented, architecture-oriented, so then you just, you know, you know, whatever you become, whether you become a banker or something, you're going to be involved with urban issues that are dramatic. You know, whether it's flooding, and, and uh, whether it's uh, rising seas, whether it's uh, heat and temperatures, whether it is uh, uh, you know, real estate taking over. Um, so what you need to think. So I'll stop at that point, and I want to hear you, how you're yeah. thinking. It's less, less, so much less of a question, more. You have to speak up. You have to speak up. It's less of a question and more of a comment, but this is talking about my personal experience and um, kind of not just the rest of school. You Can friends. you guys introduce yourselves okay. and <laughs> let them know no, no, where no. are you <laughs> in Princeton, sophomore, freshman, just started? Um, my name is Michaela. I'm a sophomore and a prospective architecture major. So. I do, I have been taking a lot of courses in the architecture department so far. Um, but I think not only does the rest of the school need to like invade the architecture department, but I think like also plan, as an architect planning your course load, like, um, so like you have like interdisciplinary like learning. And personally, my semester this, um, this semester um, has been particularly interesting because I'm taking this class. I'm also in um, an architectural theory course with DMZ. And I'm also in an urban studies course. Um, urbanism and urban policy and I'm also in um, a history of war course and like the urbanism might sound like it connects to architecture but also like the history of war class like they all like seem to have this very interesting like lineup whereas like as I progress through each of the courses they have a lot of commonalities within them and I'll be in my history of war class and I'll be thinking like wow this really connects to like this part of like uh, the French Revolution really connects to like the development of cities in my urbanism or like urban policy class and then I can see how that relates to my history theory class and then using those theories to apply to my designs in the, or, uh, in the studio class. So I think like there's it's a lot, even though like within the architecture department we don't have a lot of classes that like connect to architecture, it's actually like there are a lot of similarities with other courses that actually connect to urbanism and, uh, and architecture and I think maybe highlighting those connections to other students is 
props away to get them to realize like the importance of architecture because um, they could take a class and never and like my whole class my college class about history of war and like not actually be able to note the the relation to urbanism but like because I have taken those courses I can actually like see the connections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a very good yeah. It's a good together on a, on a problem. So what's really important for the Princeton students is to, is to work with larger universities that, that have exactly what you're talking about. If there is a, a, an issue, a problem, that they're dealing with the favelas, then you have architecture students, but you also have community groups that are, are there, uh, and also experts and so forth and so on. We, we are so small, we don't have that kind of, um, it, we have to create it. And the only way we can create it is if we start pulling you in on specific projects, like the Sao Paulo project. So I, I hope that this cooperation is going to continue somehow. If, you know, I don't know. Yeah, no, we all hope so. Yes. <clears throat> but also, uh, to go back to your question, uh, we definitely know our limits. But uh, what we hope we're doing is opening up the possibility in the future for you to find the right uh, collaborations, mm -hmm. collaborators in your projects. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, an, an experiment that I've been doing, but I'm going to uh, 
focus on uh, the spring with the seminar that I'm uh, my eternal urban seminar is to work together with the regional plan association that Christine mentioned that in itself is definitely interdisciplinary because it comes to get economists, planners, sociologists, uh, you know, developers, etc. So in a way they are going to bring the input for a specific project, but then I, I will bring the resources from the architecture side to be just one more. I mean, basically what we're saying is that here is that we are still we still believe in disciplines and we still believe in the specificity of disciplines. That is, you don't want an architect to do brain surgery, and but you don't want a brain surgeon to design the building. So I mean, just to be extreme. That is, so uh, we're convinced that we we are able we we possess a knowledge about how to shape things that we developed in our, in our discipline through centuries. So we know that. The question is that many times architects have not the limits of what we know. <clears throat> and uh, I would say most people don't know actually what architects do. So that is from a lay point of view, uh, you spend more money. Okay. Hopefully, you, we contribute more than that. You know, I would like to also open the discussion to Kurt and to Anthony. See, you know, what the intermediate generation <laughs> thinks about the, the, this conversation. Especially, I would say, in the case of Anthony, who still plays the architect in some way. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, that is, I mean, you're, you're now being standing more on the academic side for a number of years, but you still, you know, you still draw, and uh, yeah, and you will, any minute you will jump into designing a project. And, uh, <coughs> um, I mean, I think for me, one of the great, uh, you know, experiences of seeing the uh, the iterative evolution of the of the workshops and also now with the studio that we're co-teaching is how important it is uh, to, I think, broadcast and, and uh, expand the reach of architecture beyond architects. So to really, uh, for me as a historian, both of science and of, uh, of architecture, is to inform people about, it's very, it's not so hard to inform people why science is important to know about. It's kind of the biggest game in town. But also why architecture is important, and I think writing in a way that uh, not only other historians will read what I write, but also writing in a way that informs people about why the built environment is so important. And I think that's one of the great things about this studio, is that we have all of you, many of you that have not committed yourselves yet to the painful and joyful processes of becoming an architect, but you know, uh, dipping your toe in it uh, to some extent so that you get a sense of, uh, even if you don't become architects, why knowing more about the built environment and the way that architects draw and think through uh, their processes um, from the scale of a house to the garden to the larger city uh, scale uh, is important to know more about. And so in, in some ways, I'm hoping we also kind of educate you as connoisseurs of architecture and the built environment in both the very elitist, but then also in the much more kind of broad, kind of cultural sense of that too. So I think that's been really what's fun about this experiment that we're doing with all of you, which I think is quite new at Princeton in particular, right? So um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you at least all think, especially at the end of all of this. Right. Then we'll know that's going to be the proof. Yeah. One thing I well, this might be a question. For, for you all and the conversation you're having about these two institutions and I'm sure they're different in many ways but, but you're working on a project that shares a common object of concern which is water and it's interesting to me to see how water uh, both fits into an existing curriculum or series of uh, or, or a way of thinking about design and architecture but it also it also um, Exposes its limits, maybe in different ways. Uh, I wonder what's you know in 
context of our collective experiment, like what's specific about water versus uh, other uh, environmental problems in the sense of thinking uh, again about what you mentioned, Angela, about the, the implications of thinking of, at the larger scale. Uh, how does that actually, does it always position the architects in, in a certain arena of power in a way that actually everyone seems a bit uncomfortable with? Like, even you know, in, in Alexander's work, there's a kind of questioning of, that there's a thinking at that scale, but also a desire to, and to operate on other scales, maybe, of, um, of the city. Um, and so, I, I, maybe my question would be what, what is, it doesn't have to be answered, but is what's, what is specific about water? I mean, I, I think what's interesting at this moment in time, as someone who has been both educated as an architect and also taught architecture and is now a student of architectural history uh, in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, uh, it's been interesting, I mean, I'm sure Anthony has seen this too, uh, to see, to see uh, universities in the global north and south engaging with large scale environmental questions. It's interesting to me to see how there has been both a kind of embrace of what that means for education and also uh, a kind of blowback, like a, 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 a kind of distancing uh, effect, I would say, especially in the US, which Christine was referring to, a, a kind of turning away, actually. Uh, where uh, architecture proper, at least in many schools in the U.S., has, has actually uh, uh, turned its back on thinking about these issues. So, at this very moment in time. And so, I think it's an actual, at least I would say in the U.S., a, a, a debate. Uh, uh, I'd say there's a lot of friction about what these, what these objects uh, water, waste, air, <laughs> climate change actually uh, mean for design education. Um, but what I think is interesting and what I hope endures in this, in this debate is that they, they bring different ways of thinking together. You can't just be an architect anymore. You still are. You still develop that expertise, but you can't not engage with the the technical, sociological, historical, I mean, that's what strikes me about all of the workshops. Yeah. They're always talking about all these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's an exciting prospect for education. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the words that's similar to the word apparatus that I think people are using now to talk about that is infrastructure. Yeah. Infrastructure doesn't just mean uh, pipes and streets and dams and, and well, the electrical grid. It also, for many people in other fields, such as anthropology, also means people. Yep. Uh, it means language. It actually means many things at this moment in time. Uh, similar to the idea of the dispositive yep. uh, the apparatus. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what other concepts we think of. Is it yep. infrastructure? Is it something else? Uh, to actually imagine these. Uh, this this way of thinking, which is not singular, and I think that's what I've learned from sitting in these conversations. You know something? I don't know why I associate this this question, um, <coughs> which uh, was brought up by Angelos, uh, the way Angelos started his uh, <coughs> uh, his uh, speech this afternoon by describing the very, very personal, uh, that very personal moment of Alexandre sketching uh, a sketch that then stayed through all his research, which is, uh, so I would like to bring up that issue and I don't know if it's, if you want to discuss this and then talk that because I think that that goes back to architecture, to the issue of architecture, and that there is a, the, the subject. And, uh, and um, I, um, for instance, something that I wanted, I want more, and I, I want to see more and more when I look at Alexandre's drawings, is his brain. 
because um, and he's we are not sure. And what I mean by that is that you uh, you have, if you could call it a C drive, a memory of every single canal in the world. Yes. Okay, of every single lake everywhere, of every and I feel that. There, there is a pro and a con in terms of showing that. Because uh, what's really interesting about the drawings is that they make it possible for me to invent whatever I want to invent. And for the students, so that is, it's basically just a sort of neutral field that if you have knowledge of plants and a certain knowledge of but on the other hand, I think there is, in those, especially the new diagrams, an amazing encyclopedic knowledge that I know, I see, that in a, probably I just see the tip of the iceberg. And I was thinking, to what extent he owes it, Alexandre owes it to us, to, uh, you know, show, show it. You know, all those catalogs. So what I'm saying is that it's dangerous, but at the same time, that could push the project further. You see, so because, you know, there is this denial of the, of the image. Okay? Because, for instance, when you, when you show deltas, I mean, that, you just say that word, and it opens up, you know, the, the Parna delta, the, China, the yellow, you know, the, 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 yeah, exactly, yeah, and everywhere, the Amazon, and uh, I would love to see, because for your students to continue that research, they need to go and look at any, uh, every one of those deltas and extract concepts that will feed back into the, the project. I don't know, that's, you know, from outside, that, that's something that uh, I would love to see next. <laughs> and then the question that you know, the more he defines that, the more top down yeah. the project seems to be. So that's what I'm saying. Not that not to say anything about the image. Yes. Can you read it? Exactly. Yeah. So, but then on the other hand, the, the images could be totally contradictory. You see, and that could be of that could be opening up new 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 gates. And that's what architects do. That is when you develop a project, you could go this way or that way. And you know you keep diverging and making choices. A good way to illustrate this contradiction here yeah. is a sunset and a sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> nice. They're announcing the completely the opposite event. Yeah. It's like uh, but what is, is very peculiar about the sketch of the country is that the sketch is a description of geography. You know? yeah. The rivers are already there. And so and some of them are completely hidden. There's a uh, the revealing as well. Yeah. But he's at the same time in bed. Yeah, okay. that's, what, that's what I find interesting, yeah. and that's what actually I would push because for me that's the real architecture yeah. there. But you know is. that uh, suddenly he would flood three neighborhoods yeah. <laughs> with three thousand people to get those lakes or something, <laughs> and uh, so so for me that's what's super interesting. Yeah. But that's why this is very tricky. Uh, tricky issue. Yeah, this scale. But I, I, I would like to, 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 to go back to this idea of interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm. Just one, one yeah. to mention one thing. You know, if we, you know, if I think a, a, a skill that is really important, like like an expertise for an architect, uh, so. First, uh, I, I could consider to be able to build stuff, but maybe this is not the most important. This is just the most, the most uh, maybe uh, the most important one is to be able to talk. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and so the idea, the talk, any dialogue, 
will be always a dialogue in between different persons or different approaches and, and then different disciplines. So it's, a, it's our... But maybe what is really an expertise is to be able to talk and to record this talking or our understanding in a way that is something suitable to be built. So maybe, you know, but I, I, I think this is, is a, a, a way to describe the, the interdisciplinarity is something that is completely uh, closely related to what we do all the time. Mm. But the, I, 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 I like very much the proposed by Christina I mean, to, to think about uh, our activities you know, as universities. And because today we are closing one term of it, but at the same time, I was starting a studio and uh, will be another one coming. So, and what I, I think that is very, you mentioned about learning and teaching, but also, no, it could be researching, mm -hmm. it could be, uh, I don't know how to say, mm -hmm. so that, uh, it could be extension to say the mm -hmm. tripod of the idea of a university, mm -hmm. the teaching, research, and uh, Working with the community, mm -hmm. extending to communication. No, 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 no. Extending the activities to the society. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, although kind of word, but it's not extension. It's not extension. Mm -hmm. Although you were um, younger than us, and and the, the, the institutions are different uh, in several ways. I, I, I like very much to think or to consider that the university is one single institution uh, in the whole world. So, and the way we exchange, we uh, we we talk, we interact, this is makes all of us at the same time uh, better. You know, the so, we have to find the, the, the channels, the way through which we can uh, exchange more and more, talk more and more, and understand each other, each other better and better. This is So, <coughs> I guess we're getting to a lot of this. Yes. I think that this is on you and and I wish I did it too. Closing comments. Closing. Closing. <laughs> Closing. Closing step. What is the infrastructure of this? Since 2009, we proposed that the first six students of that public cultural project the tennis infrastructure and uh, this three, three years, five years of joint research program concentrate our uh, conversation around the infrastructure. This is very important as you understand the infrastructure as a point to maintain the conversation to I'd like to ask my student to because for us, for us, that point is really for you. Connect our discussions 
discussions with the researcher they developed and in the studio, in the, in the studio this is um, connected directly or indirectly is um, not thing because actually we talk about the public architecture and the future project. And the public architecture is more than the state the relation approach of architecture. The future project is a human condition. Always design the future. And maybe we could um, design our relationship in the next year. So our side will be always very well company with your students. It's a pleasure for us if the boat begins. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to thank Philip for you, but uh, uh, Louise and Natasha for the degree in Houston. It was very important for them and for us to do because it, they, they had a great opportunity to develop this stage. And I would like to send a lot of students on the top, undergraduate and postgraduate. No, I uh, definitely. I wanted to start by saying that uh, yeah, I hope that it was, it was relatively easy uh, for me to bring my students. It was a lot more complicated for you to bring your students to Princeton. But uh, I feel that uh, this year's uh, experiment was very successful, and that we now. We all know the difficulties of uh, coordinating that because obviously the Princeton bureaucracy is a lot more complicated than the speed bureaucracy. So, um, uh, yeah, I hope that uh, we will continue that. And uh, I also uh, <coughs> feel that, you know, when I propose to uh, our dean that uh, because she asked me to develop this studio because she liked the this interdisciplinary seminar I was doing. So I said, well, I, you know, I think I wanted to go to Brazil. And she said, what for? He said, well, for fun. But <laughs> it's not fun. It's no more than fun. Because I thought that uh, in terms of, as you could see from my previous experience, those three studios, those three studios, uh, this was very fertile ground for imagination and for you know, getting to a place where you look at things with the distance, which helps distance always make things very difficult to recognize. And then obviously you want to supplement that lack of understanding. And if you're good, you do with imagination. So that was the formula. And, uh, and uh, I thought that, I mean, this year is definitely a a more uh, radical experiment because I was dealing with uh, students who were seniors and had a number of years of architecture. But uh, from Anthony's and my experience and the third leg of our studio, which is crucial, it's a master student, uh, Jacob, who has been also crucial in terms of the knowledge that we have to disseminate at uh, the speed of light. <laughs> Uh, we only have 12 weeks. I mean, Princeton has the shortest semester in America. <laughs> any, any kind of, you know? Shortest and longest, depending on how you count the weeks. Any school, yeah. yeah. Any yeah. school has at least 13 or 14 weeks. Or 12 weeks. <laughs> and Princeton is now trying to change their calendar. That's All professors, so no way to touch the 12 weeks. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that it's you know we have to compress that knowledge, but uh, this actually uh, you know in how many like two months of month and a half six weeks of classes I feel that uh, they're totally equipped to build. So <laughs> I mean at least to build models. 
<laughs> so, and then, you know, once you build them all, you're equipped to build a building. Yeah, that's okay? true. So, uh, there, there are few. I agree. No, he, he's an architect. And uh, we've been plotting with uh, Anthony ways to do models that are buildable next time. So, that's basically our challenge for the next six weeks when we come back. So, um, well, I think that was also very important from my point of view is the uh, fantastic in the literal sense uh, and uh, the number of incredibly good architectural buildings in San Paolo. And I think that uh, you need to feed good architecture with good buildings. So I just, even if they don't, if the students don't know exactly what you know what they're looking at, but uh, in a way, hopefully, they will trust our selection of buildings, which is not ours, I mean, it's common knowledge among architects. And I think that that's will that will give them raw materials to play with. You know, I always say it's not like you're not even going to get inspired by it. But for me, the uh, best analogy is that this is a diving board to jump into the pool back to work. So uh, it's very different to be on the diving board and swim. Okay, but that impulse is what I think this uh, this contact with good architecture will be. So, um, so you know, and I'm thinking now about the future because as I said, you know, this is the first of uh, what's going to be a permanent course. I don't know how long I'm going to teach it, but we're establishing now the parameters of, of this course might be in the future. So uh, anyway, so that's all I want to say. I actually wanted to add something. This is not the right time, but I received an email yesterday from the President of the Institute saying so, <laughs> because they actually sent me a previous email saying we're opening up the, the fellowship for research this next summer and we haven't heard from you. So I'm going to explain to you what that is because they're paying for eight weeks of research which is probably going to be here in Mexico. So um, we can talk and then you know I hope that the same way that we are open to receiving your students you will receive a couple of our students if they, I mean, we've done it before. They can all stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, and they might like it so much. <laughs> so anyway, so we'll talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, I would like to Absolutely. I actually participated in this drawing 30 years ago in the night of the night. Watch. No, and Christina, no, and Christina, and who, Christina was, who was Christina, the, wow. Yes. But besides, well, she, was the, she, she was the director and when I came here the first time and I proposed, we proposed this idea and she embraced it. She said, okay, it sounds great. So we have the full support. The first exhibition to the museum of sculpture, all this Dabash, was about the the project. And Christina was fundamental research in that entire project. What? Okay.